It's probably one of the most iconic symbols of chemistry. It has made its way onto t-shirts and coffee mugs, and of course science classrooms all over the world. What you may not have been aware of is that there's been many different ways to organize the elements, and some of them have looked pretty crazy. But eventually we landed on this one. This lesson is all about the periodic table. So what are we gonna learn in this lesson? First we'll learn the history of the modern periodic table, and then we'll learn the properties of some of the chemical families on the periodic table. And then finally we'll learn how the periodic table can be used to predict the properties of elements according to patterns and trends. The first widely accepted periodic table was designed by a Russian scientist named Dmitry Mendeleev. He organized the elements by increasing atomic mass. His periodic table was useful because it organized elements in such a way that he could predict the properties of other elements and even predict the existence of undiscovered elements. You can notice the blanks and question marks in his periodic table. In 1913, a British scientist named Henry Moseley made a breakthrough with his research involving x-rays of elements that led to the discovery of the atomic number. The atomic number is the exact number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. The periodic table was rearranged to organize elements by increasing atomic number, and the modern periodic table was created. The natural outcome of this organization was the periodic law, which states that when elements are organized by increasing atomic number, the elements will be grouped by common properties, and the properties of elements can be predicted by trends and patterns. The modern periodic table has nice neat rows and columns. The columns are called groups, or chemical families, and the rows are called periods. The modern periodic table has been arranged so that elements are grouped into families. There are three broad families or categories of elements, and then there are five more specific families that we're going to learn. The three broad categories are metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Metals are elements on the left side of this stair step. Metals share similar properties with one another. In general, they are hard, shiny, they conduct electricity, they are malleable, and ductile. Nonmetals are to the right of this stair step. In general, their properties are the opposite of metals. They're mostly gases, but they can be solid or liquid. They don't conduct electricity, and they are brittle when they are solid. This stair step isn't a definite border between metals and nonmetals. In general, as you move from the left to right across the periodic table, elements are going to become less metallic. Some of the elements that touch the stair step have equal properties of both metals and nonmetals. We call these elements metalloids, like silicon. Silicon is shiny and solid, yet it's very brittle. It conducts electricity, but only slightly. We call it a semiconductor. There are some more specific groups on the periodic table. In general, elements that are in the same column will share similar properties. Here are some of the common families. First column is the alkali metals. Second column is the alkaline earth metals. This middle section is called the transition metals. This column over here is called the halogens, and then this last column is the noble gases. Alkali metals are soft, reactive metals. They become more reactive and softer as you move down the column. Alkaline earth metals are hard, reactive metals, a little less reactive than the alkali metals. The transition metals are generally not as reactive as alkali or alkaline earth metals. They are solid metals except for mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature. Halogens are very reactive nonmetals. They are gases at the top of the family, and they become solid as you move down the column. They are the most reactive elements on the periodic table. They are most reactive at the top, and they get less reactive as you move down the column, opposite the trend of alkali metals. Finally, the noble gases are all gases. They are unreactive, or in other words, inert. The periodic table is useful for predicting the properties of elements according to patterns and trends. We call this periodic law, or periodicity. We will talk about three trends, atomic radius, ionization energy, and electronegativity. First, atomic radius. This is the size of an atom. It's defined as the distance between two bonding nuclei. It's a weird sounding definition, but remember that electrons are in funny shaped clouds. They don't really have a definite edge. The nucleus, on the other hand, is dense and unmoving part of the atom. So when two atoms bond, we can measure the distance between the two nucleus. In general, atoms get larger as you move down a column. This is because each time you move down a row, you add another energy level. I'll show you by comparing lithium to sodium. Notice that sodium has an additional energy level as compared to lithium. In general, atoms get smaller as you move from left to right across the period. Take period number two. Each element has the same number of occupied energy levels, 
but the charge in the nucleus increases because one proton is added as we move from element to element across the periodic table. The greater the charge of the nucleus, the greater the pull on those energy levels, and they get pulled in closer and closer. So a neon atom is smaller than a carbon atom. Next is ionization energy. Atoms can lose or gain electrons. Why would they want to do that? Well, in general, atoms want to have eight electrons in their outermost energy level. This energy level is called the valence energy level, or valence shell. There are two ways to get eight electrons. Elements could lose their valence electrons and uncover a new valence shell, or gain electrons to complete their current valence shell. Let's compare chlorine to sodium. Sodium will lose one electron to uncover a stable valence shell beneath. Chlorine will gain one valence electron to complete its current valence shell. Atoms that have lost electrons are called cations, and when an atom turns into a cation, it gets smaller. Atoms that have gained electrons are called anions, and when an atom turns into an anion, it gets larger. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from the valence shell. The greater the ionization energy, the more difficult it is to remove an electron. Metals have low ionization energies. It's easier to remove electrons from a metal than it is from a non-metal. Non-metals have high ionization energies. It's more difficult to remove an electron from a non-metal because they would rather gain electrons, just like chlorine. As you move from left to right across a period, the ionization energy will increase. As you move down a column, the ionization energy will decrease. The reason ionization energy decreases as you move down is because as you move down a column, you add a new energy level each time. And so the valence electrons are further and further away from the nucleus. They're further away from the positive charge that's pulling on the electrons. And so it's easier to remove an electron. And so fluorine has a higher ionization energy than boron. Electronegativity is kind of the opposite of ionization energy. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself. In general, metals have low electronegativity and nonmetals have high electronegativity. A high electronegativity means that the atom has a strong ability to attract electrons to itself. So moving from left to right across the periodic table, the electronegativity increases. Moving down a column, the electronegativity decreases. According to this trend, Noble gases should have the highest electronegativity, or the greatest pull in electrons. But remember that noble gases have eight valence electrons, and so they don't want to gain or lose electrons. So the electronegativity of noble gases would be nothing, it'd be zero. So which element has the highest electronegativity? Well, that would be fluorine, because fluorine is the furthest to the right and furthest to the top. So did you learn everything in this lesson? Well, if you did, you learned that the modern periodic table is organized by increasing atomic number. There are three broad categories of elements, metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Elements in the same column are similar to one another. We call these chemical families or groups. Finally, we learned about three different trends in the periodic table, electronegativity, ionization energy, and atomic radius.